Carl Cohen, Why Animals Have No Right. So, who is Carl Cohen? Well, he was born in 1931, and he's still alive today. And we can see here a few different pictures of Carl. A couple when he is probably about how he looks today, and then a picture there on the right when he was a younger man. Carl's the professor of philosophy at the resident college of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He co-authored the animal rights debate in 2001 with Tom Regan, which is part of what brings him into our discussion today. He's also written a standard introduction to logic textbook, which is still widely used in universities. And he's written widely on political philosophy, ethics, and all kinds of other topics of social philosophy. So let's look at the argument we're going to find in Cohen, and this is using his words, so this is pulled directly from the text. Premise 1. A right, properly understood, is a claim or potential claim that one party may exercise against another. Rights arise and can be intelligibly defended only among beings who actually do or can make moral claims against one another. Animals are not beings of a kind capable of exercising or responding to moral claims. So, animals therefore have no rights, and they can have none. Now, we might want to clean this argument up a little bit just to make it a little bit more straightforward. If we do that, it might look like this. A right is a claim that one party may exercise against another. Rights arise and can be defended only among beings who can make moral claims against one another. Animals are not beings of a kind capable of exercising moral claims. So therefore, animals have no rights and they can have none. All right. Now we're going to go through the text of Cohen's article and consider it a little more closely. A right, properly understood, is a claim or potential claim that one party may exercise against another. All right, so a right is a claim or a potential claim that one party may exercise against another. The target against who such a claim may be registered can be a single person, a group, a community, or perhaps all of humankind. To comprehend any genuine right fully, we must know who holds the right, against whom it is held, and to what it is a right. Alternative sources of rights add complexity. Some rights are grounded in constitution and law, for example, the right of an accused to trial by jury. Some rights are moral, but give no legal claim, for example, my right to your keeping the promise you gave me, and some rights, for example, against theft or assault, are rooted both in morals and in the law. The attributes of human beings from which the moral capability arises have been described variously by philosophers both ancient and modern. The inner consciousness of free will by St. Augustine, the grasp by human reason of the binding character of moral law, St. Thomas, the self-conscious participation of human beings in, a, in an objective ethical order, Hegel, human membership in an organic moral community, Bradley, the development of the human self through the consciousness of other moral selves, Mead, and the underivative intuitive cognition of the rightness of action, Pritchard. So there we see everybody's name, except Pritchard. I couldn't quite fit him in. Most influential has been Immanuel Kant's emphasis on the universal human possession of a uniquely moral will and the autonomy its use entails. Humans confront choices that are purely moral. Humans, but certainly not dogs or mice, lay down moral laws for other and for themselves. Human beings are self-legislative, morally autonomous. This is Kant on the left, and we'll remember that Kant um, was covered in our previous section on ethics. Animals, that is non-human animals in the ordinary sense of the word, lack this capacity for free moral judgment. They are not beings of a kind 
capable of exercising or responding to moral claims. Animals, therefore, have no rights, and they can have none. So here we see the guts of the argument, right? Animals lack the capacity for free moral judgment, and this is because they're not the kind of beings capable of exercising or responding to moral claims. Following from this, they have no rights, and according to Cohen, can have none. This is the core of the argument about the alleged rights of animals. The holder of rights must have the capacity to comprehend rules of duty, governing all, including themselves. In applying such rules, the holders of rights must recognize possible conflicts between what is in their own interest and what is just. Only a community of beings capable of self-restricting moral judgments can the concept of a right be correctly invoked. So the idea here is that rights can only exist between people who have the capacity to understand them, and this requires something like judgment. So we see this taking place on the left. Uh, the person on the left can have a, a right to hold something against the person on or the group of people on the right, um, because both groups have judgment. However, between the cat and the chicken, uh, the cat and the chicken cannot have rights because they don't have capacities such as judgment to be able to um, work these out. Humans have such moral capabilities. They are, in this sense, self-legislative, are members of communities governed by moral rules, and do possess rights. Animals do not possess such moral capacities. They are not morally self-legislative, cannot possibly be members of a true moral community, and therefore cannot possess rights. In conducting research on animal subjects, therefore, we do not violate their rights because they have none to violate. So we see that the idea is that because humans are self-legislative and because they're members of communities governed by moral rules, they possess rights. However, animals don't possess these moral capacities, and following from this, they don't have access to rights. To animate life, even in its simplest form, we give a certain natural reverence. But the possession of rights presupposes a moral status not attained by the vast majority of living things. We must not infer, therefore, that a live being has, simply in being alive, a right to its life. The assertion that all animals, only because they are alive and have interests, also possess the right to life, is an abuse of that phrase, and wholly without warrant. Okay? So, uh, we can see that humans, they have reverence for animals, just in the same way that I assume most of us have reverence for things like our pets, and maybe even reverence for the food we eat. But this doesn't mean, according to Cohen, that animals have a right to their lives. It does not follow from this, however, that we're morally free to do anything we please to animals. Certainly not. In our dealings with animals, as in our dealings with other human beings, we have obligations that do not arise from claims against us based on rights. Rights entail obligations, but many of the things one ought to do are in no way tied to another's entitlement. Rights and obligations are not reciprocals of one another, and it's a serious mistake to suppose that they are. So, we see here, uh, looking at our cartoons below, that um, even though animals have no rights, this doesn't mean that we are morally free to do anything we please to them. So we can't chop the cat with a sword. This is not acceptable. However, um, just because animals don't have rights doesn't mean that we don't have obligations to them. Okay, so we can have an obligation to take care of our animals, for example, but notice that an obligation is not the same as a right. Plainly, 
The grounds of our obligations to humans and to animals are manifold and cannot be formulated simply. Some hold that there's a general obligation to do no gratuitous harm to sentient creatures, the principle of non-malfeasance. Some hold that there's a general obligation to do good to sentient creatures when that's reasonably within one's power, the principle of beneficence. In our dealings with animals, few will deny that we're at least obligated to act humanely, that is, to treat them with decency and concern that we owe, as sensitive human beings, to other sentient creatures. To treat animals humanely, however, is not to treat them as humans or as holders of rights. So here, Cohen is expanding on what these types of obligations that we hold to animals might be, and he gives us a list of possible ways that these obligations have been spelled out. So he identifies one by um, talking about the principle of non-malfeasance, um, and then another when he talks about the principle of beneficence. Um, and basically what he's saying here is that, look, uh, although animals don't have rights, this doesn't mean that we don't have obligations to them. And in fact, these can be uh, very wide ranging obligations, as we see explained above. So this is Carl Cohen's argument about animals and rights. Now we're going to consider a couple of objections that he talks about. Objection one. If having rights requires being able to make moral claims to grasp and apply moral laws, then many humans, the brain damaged, the comatose, the senile, who plainly lack those capacities, must be without rights. But this is absurd. So, rights do not but depend on the presence of moral capacities. So, how this objection goes is it's saying, hey, if rights require being able to make moral claims and being able to grasp moral laws, look, there's many humans who don't have these abilities, right? Uh, brain damage, the comatose, the senile. They don't have the capacity to grasp moral laws. So, given that, rights can't possibly depend on the presence of these moral capacities. Let's see how Cohen responds. This objection fails. It mistakenly treats an essential feature of humanity as though it were a screen for sorting humans. The capacity for moral judgment that distinguishes humans from animals is not a test to be administered to human beings one by one. Persons who are unable, because of some disability, to perform the four full moral functions natural to human beings are certainly not, for that reason, ejected from the moral community. The issue is one of kind. Humans are of such a kind that they may be subject of experiments only with their voluntary consent. The choices they make freely must be respected. Animals are of such a kind that it's impossible for them in principle to give or withhold voluntary consent or to make moral choice. What humans retain when disabled, animals have never had. So the idea here is that this objection doesn't work because it's treating what Cohen identifies as essential features of humanity as though these were things that we could use to sort humans into different groups. So basically what's, what Cohen is saying is that the ability to um, identify the moral law and follow it is in the essence or in the very being of what it means to be a human. And because it's in a human's essence, it doesn't matter if the human is able to exercise that or not, right? So as in the case of the comatose or the senile, they may not be able to exercise moral judgment and access to the moral law, but that doesn't mean that they don't have that capacity. That capacity is a part of their essence. However, it's not an essential feature of animals, right? So what humans retain, even with, when disabled, animals have never had. All right, let's move on to objection two. 
Capacities will not succeed in distinguishing humans from other animals. Animals also reason. Animals also communicate with one another. Animals also care passionately for their young. Animals also exhibit desires and preferences. Features of moral relevance, rationality, independence, and love are not exhibited uniquely by humans. Therefore, this critic concludes, there can be no solid moral distinction between humans and other animals. So, how this objection works, right? It's claiming that, look, these capacities actually will not work to distinguish humans from animals. After all, animals reason, animals communicate, animals care for their young, animals exhibit desires, all of the characteristics that we've identified as essentially human. Given this, there can be no moral distinction between humans and animals. Well, let's see how Cohen responds to this. This criticism misses the central point. It's not the ability to communicate or to reason or dependence on one another or care for the young or the exhibition of preference or any such behavior that marks the critical divide. Analogies between human families and those of monkeys or between human communities and those of wolves and the like are entirely beside the point. Patterns of conduct are not at issue. Animals do, do indeed exhibit remarkable behavior at times. Conditioning, fear, instinct, and intelligence all contribute to species survival. Membership in a community of moral agents nevertheless remains impossible for them. Actors subject to moral judgment must be capable of grasping the generality of an ethical premise in a practical syllogism. Humans act immorally, often enough, but only they, never wolves or monkeys, can discern by applying some moral rule to the fact of the case that a given act ought or ought not be performed. The moral restraints imposed by humans on themselves are thus highly abstract and are often in conflict with the self-interest of the agent. Communal behavior among animals, even when most intelligent and most endearing, does not approach autonomous morality in the fundamental sense. So here what Cohen is doing is saying, yes, animals have the, many of the similar capacities that humans have, right? Uh, but to identify those, that, and to say because of that, uh, animals have the same moral standing as humans is to miss the whole point of his argument. What he's pointing out is that humans are able, because they can exercise rights against each other, they're able to be part of a moral community where each member of the community can hold rights against the other members of the community. And this is something that, no matter how intelligent they seem, animals cannot maintain. Because uh, communal behavior among animals, even when most intelligent and most endearing, does not approach autonomous morality in the fundamental sense. All right, let's look at the argument one last time. A right is a claim that one party may exercise against another. Rights arise and can be defended only among beings who can make moral claims against one another. Animals are not beings of a kind capable of exercising moral claims. So animals therefore have no rights and they can have none. Now, what do you think of Cohen's argument?